All right, let me get the lights adjusted and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, give me a moment. And there we go. All right. So everybody, welcome back to the freshman seminar. We are here in week 10, so the semester's getting close to winding down. Um, just a few quick announcements. So um, uh, if you recall, last time I mentioned that this week and the next couple weeks are going to be some Marshall-themed presentations, and that begins uh, today. But I do want to highlight what's going on next week. Um, as you all are probably aware, the uh, spring schedule got released. I'm sure some of you are starting to think about what classes you need to take next semester uh, and what have you. You know, uh, what math classes do I take and, and, and what classes do I take to keep moving forward. Um, we're going to have an advanced registration session in here next week, so you really want to uh, uh, attend that. That'll help you out uh, quite a bit. Of course, you do want to be meeting with your faculty advisor sometime uh, in the next couple weeks to ensure that you're, you're on the right track. Um, also, don't forget the, uh, the student chapter meetings that are still going on, the Theta Tall meetings, uh, SAME, ASC, and the mechanicals. Make sure that you're uh, attending those uh, whenever possible. Now, again, just like always, we're going to have a quiz uh, made available sometime later today, and it'll, be, uh, it'll close on November 4th at 11 a.m., so make sure you're getting that uh, done on time. Uh, any questions? All right. So, um, like I said, uh, this week begins some, some Marshall-themed uh, presentations, and uh, we wanted to take some time and talk to you about some of the oppor other opportunities available to you within the College of Information Technology and Engineering. So, uh, our two main speakers are going to be from the Division of Computer Science and the Division of Applied Science and Technology, and they're going to tell you a little bit about some of the other programs available here on campus. But before that, like always, we're going to have a faculty come in and introduce themselves. Our faculty uh, this week who's introducing themselves is Dr. Ana Peña-Alvarez. Uh, she's new here, just started here uh, this semester, uh, and she's a mechanical engineer. She's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what she does. Everybody, let's give her a round of applause. So I just have to like use this one, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. No, you're fine. Well, um, as Dr. Greg uh, said, I'm Ana Peña. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, um, and I have a PhD in mechanical engineering, but actually my bachelor was in mechatronics engineering. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of my academic background first, um, what I have worked on doing. Uh, I have done some research uh, specifically in nanotechnology. So let's see some pictures. Um, I did my PhD in the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, my thesis was related to how um, we can use lasers to modify materials at the micro and nano scale for photovoltaic applications, for data storage, um, for security, um, and basically just uh, uh, things that we can't see but uh, have a huge impact in our lives, like you know, our phones and uh, LEDs and panels and everything. Um, if you don't know the University of Manchester, there's uh, some cool facts. For example, I don't know if you've seen the, that movie, The Imitation Game, with um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, basically, that's where the first computer was invented. So how many of you have seen that movie? Yeah, well, if you have time, watch it. It's quite cool. Um, also, the, um, the library at the University of Manchester is quite um, impressive. Uh, they have the first record of the New Testament. It's pap Papyrus 52. So that small piece of uh, Papyrus is there. So that's quite cool to go and see. Also, in 2010, um, the Nobel Prize was awarded to one of the professors, professors there for the discovery of graphene. So how many of you have, have heard of graphene? Yeah? Graphene is basically the thinnest material on Earth. Uh, they discovered that in the University of Manchester. So for me, it was a great experience just to go and talk to them in their lab and you know, learn more about this super material, which is thought to be like an alternative to silicon. So a lot of research is going uh, on that specific um, field of material science. And who knows who these guys are? Oh, no, this is bad. <laughs> Uh, well, this is the greatest band on earth, um, Oasis, um, big names. They're from Manchester, so 
I don't know. Maybe you can listen to some of their music. Wonderwall rings a bell. Don't look back in anger. Dr. Greg, do you know them? <laughs> All right. Um, they disintegrated, so they're no longer a band, but they're really cool. Um, this is them again. I'm not obsessed or anything, but <laughs> now this is where I did my, my bachelor. This is my hometown in Mexico. Um, it's Monterrey. That's the name of the city. It's in the north of Mexico. I went to um, Monterrey Tech, so this is the university. And it's a city that is surrounded by mountains, quite big, like six million people in that city. Uh, as you can see, we have a big mountain in the middle, that one. And this is Oasis with the mountain in the back. <laughs> so, okay. Um, there I did mechatronics, and that's another field um, that you know integrates um, control, automation, mechanical systems, and electronic systems. So um, that was my first uh, degree. And then I decided to go for the mechanical um, route, which is uh, what I enjoy mo the most from, from, this, uh, from this engineering. Um, uh, more of my academic background, I have done some uh, collaboration with the university, um, the National University of Singapore, um, SIMTEC, which is their institute for manufacturing. If you ever have the opportunity to visit Singapore, you have to go. It's an amazing um, country, small. It's almost like a country city because it's so small, but it's, it is uh, amazing. And I also did some uh, international um, exchange when I was uh, doing my bachelor in Finland in this university and also in Germany. Um, I did a lot of uh, uh, PLC courses, machine learning, uh, vision learning, more on the mechatronic side. Um, of my um, of my studies. That's me paying attention in a conference. I was probably wondering what they were talking about, but uh, yeah, that looks that I'm interested. Um, teaching experience. This is my first um, actual, you know, uh, position as an assistant professor. I have done tutoring and also I was a postgraduate assistant at Manchester. Um, these were some of my uh, students. I was giving a presentation there in Singapore. So I have thought engineering mechanics, control engineering, and I have also led um, a micro nano fabrication lab in the DC in Manchester. Um, industry background. So I finished my PhD in 2011, and I jumped straight from the PhD into industry. Uh, I got a job in Schneider Electric R&D. So I was doing um, a lot of uh, product design. I started as a senior design engineer for them. Uh, well, I just quit my first job here. This is before the PhD. I, um, I ended up uh, doing industrial planning, which was very different to my uh, mechatronics um, degree. But um, it was good because I learned to, you know, sometimes you end up doing things that you didn't study for. But all of them uh, help you in, um, in some way to acquire discipline and to learn from different, um, uh, different areas in, in engineering. Um, so for, for them, I did um, a forecast model uh, for investments. And it was more like management than you know, actual uh, engineering. But then when I started working in Schneider Electric, um, I did a lot of, as I mentioned, uh, new product development. I was also in charge of the um, patent um, activity for them. And when I say North America is United States, Canada, and Mexico. So um, um, Schneider Electric has a lot of design centers. The main one, uh, the headquarters are in Nashville. So I traveled a lot uh, back and forth um, in, this, in this job. And I ended up as a solid mechanics specialist. Uh, I did a lot of uh, structural analysis. And my specialty was mechanism analysis and design, which is what I'm teaching now here in Marshall. Um, I used Adams for this, um, you know, uh, kinematics and kinetics. It studies how um, bodies um, move, rigid bodies. That's different to what you see in structural analysis with, you know, all this an um, software like ANSYS and um, uh, FEMAP. So, but I did both, uh, static, uh, transient, seismic. Basically, they will send us a product with a problem, 
and we have to find like how to improve it, how to change it, uh, how to optimize it. Uh, one of our biggest clients for Schneider, Schneider Electric is a company that uh, manufactures energy management products. So from large uh, switch gear um, equipment to like small circuit breakers, the ones you have at home, they're probably Square D. Square D is part of Schneider Electric. It's a massive company. It's all over the world. So it's interesting in a way, um, it was interesting to work for them because I had a lot of interaction with engineers from all over uh, the world, in Europe and Asia, and we used to get projects from everywhere. So we will analyze small things like bolts uh, under stress up to like big um, um, switch gear and uh, transformers and all sorts. So. Um, one, I was saying one of our biggest clients was Google. They used to buy a lot of um, um, switch boxes to um, power their, their servers. And they were very specific about the functioning and of, our, of the equipment. They wanted everything to, you know, I mean, obviously their, their servers cannot fail. <laughs> so it was very intensive in the way that everything had to be accurate and precise. So um, that was really cool. Working in the industry gave me a lot of per perspective, and everything that I learned during my bachelor and my uh, post um, of my doctorate, it made sense. When you're in the industry, working for you know a real um, you know in a real environment for a company that sells millions of dollars every year, uh, billions, um, it does make sense what you're doing right now as a as a student. And this is a day in the life of an engineer. So the last one, it looks pretty serious, but it's not that serious. I used to work with Austin Powers. <laughs> that was my, one of my best friends in the office. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a very relaxing, uh, working in, in design, engineering design, it's very relaxing in the sense that um, you are not in, like, in a manufacturing plant. So we used to have a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was hard work and it was very stressful because um, obviously in industry, you have to have a very fast pace in order to meet like the client's um, needs and expectations. But we also had a lot of fun. This, this is the uh, design center where I used to work and my friends in Halloween <laughs> and um, my boss. So, yeah. Um, these are the courses I'm gonna be teaching next spring. Uh, kinematics, design of mechanical systems, and NX introduction to CAD. So, hopefully, I'll see you. I'll see some of you guys in, in one of these. And um, this is a bit of my research. This is more in the nanotechnology um, area. Um, you know, I always point. This is one of the most um, famous um, biomimetic um, applications of nanotechnology. How we know that the uh, color that um, we see, for example, in butterflies or in nature, it doesn't come from chemical pigments. It comes from structural or physical um, um, uh, patterns in, in the wings of a butterfly. Or, for example, we have that self-cleaning application of, of lotus leaves. You know how the different surfaces at the micro nano um, range make uh, the water roll off and clean itself um, and clean the plant itself and gecko um, uh, feet and uh, shark skin. So this is some of the equipment I used during my PhD, like to see very tiny features. I, um, I did this during my doctoral studies, you know, how to change that silicon. For example, this is a piece of silicon. So how to change the color of silicon through like the use of um, equipment like lasers, how to modify the material at that length to to have an effect. And funnily enough, um, many people used to say to me, like, Why, how are you going to apply your PhD studies, like in real life? Well, when I was in Schneider, they were investing a lot on nanotechnology for energy management. And um, one of the applications was um, how to conduct heat in a better way to make um, products more efficient. Because if you conduct heat uh, more efficiently, you save on copper. And as you know, copper is very expensive at the moment. So it was a, it was a challenge on how to improve the um, insulation 
uh, layer on um, big busways and it's everything everything um, has an application and not because maybe it doesn't sound like you know like oh it's just on paper or it's just for you know publication purposes it doesn't mean that industry is not interested in it and they're willing to invest like Schneider Electric used to invest five percent of all their um, of our, of all their um, income in research so that was cool too and now just to finalize interests and hobbies well I like travel I love the walking dead my husband introduced me to them because I never used to watch them and now I'm obsessed <laughs> uh, food obviously and coffee and these are some of my pictures from traveling around the, um, Obviously, I cannot travel anymore, <laughs> so travel as soon as you can. When you finish school, go a year abroad or something and enjoy it. And that's my son, <laughs> um, Christmas baby, so I'll be back in the spring. And my best advice for you is you have made the best decision already. You have no idea how many people tell me, oh, I wish I, I could have done engineering. Like, everybody says the same when you know, when they're in the real world working, everybody wants to be an engineer. So you're in the right path already. Um, work hard, it pays off. As I mentioned before, uh, in the end, everything makes sense. Don't be afraid to ask. Like, nobody's going to think anything wrong if you ask some, a simple question. And if they do, they're stupid. <laughs> and um, keep asking why. How does this work? Where does it come from? Hold on, how did we get the value of, of X? That's the biggest question ever, like, how do we get there? And keep asking until you are convinced. That's it. First off, round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Any quick questions before we move on? All right, thank you very much. I no, guess we're going to turn it over to our main speaker, or one of our main speakers. And uh, I'll go ahead and get uh, it. Hello everyone. Some of you guys know me from my safety technology, introductory safety technology class. I can see some of the students are here. So hopefully you would not be bored with my lecture. I am trying to introduce you to the idea of applying safety techniques and why should you do it, how should you do it very in, in an interesting way. If I say the word just safety, what does it come to you? What do you think of it? Huh? <laughs> yes, personal safety is definitely important. Let's say occupational safety. You are working somewhere and you want to be safe. What does it come to you? Huh? OSHA. OSHA comes to you because OSHA is Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So they are a regulatory and very much compliance oriented organization. What is this, what does this picture tells you about? <clears throat> this is the Columbia Space Shuttle which later was destroyed. It was a big disaster in 2003. So NASA was sending seven of its astronauts to the International Space Station. They started their journey on 16th of January. They were supposed to come back on 3rd of February. They could not. What happened? As soon as the space shuttle started its journey from its external wings, left external uh, wing, one small piece of foam actually fell down. Well, the ground people knew it, they were working on it, but they could not inform them. They thought it's a minor mistake. Slowly after two days, they calculated that this could lead to a loss of sensor while they would be coming back. As soon as it would reach the Earth's orbit, they might lose all the sensor information. They actually did. As soon as it came back to the Earth's orbit, just 10 minutes before they were supposed to land, 
all the sensor information was gone. There was no connection between the earth and the space shuttle. All of the seven astronauts died. It was a huge, I would say, mistake in simplifying the safety aspect. There was a commission board, inquiry commission board later and they found it out that NASA was not keeping enough information on the safety, uh, you know, um, outcomes or uh, there was no safety division separately which would follow this kind of incidences and would like to implement the uh, solutions. Based on that, uh, these are the seven on board uh, astronauts, sorry for them. Based on that inquiry information, right now they have a well established safety center. And from this time onwards, 2003, 2004, 2005, we have seen a lot of research and development is going on in NASA's safety centers. What do they do? They have simulated areas. They just want to see whether this space chute is better than that one, which one is lighter. Uh, what is the average weight of a space chute? The suit that they wear, it's around 14 kg, so it's heavy. So they have several troubles when they use it. They have problems in moving their hands, they have problem in moving their, you know, um, uh, low back. And while they come back on earth after two months or after two weeks, whatever the time length is, they find themselves vulnerable to several musculoskeletal disorders and it has been documented. So that is how the research is going on. They are trying to make things as competitive, as efficient, as user friendly as possible. Does it apply only to NASA? No. In every sphere, let us say the chairs that you are using. Let us say you are using this kind of chairs and you are sitting in front of a computer and you are doing 4 to 5 hours of data entry. Maybe after 7 days, maybe after 10 days, maybe after 7 months, depending on how vulnerable you were, you might develop a low back pain <coughs> because the curve of the chair did not match the curve of your spine and your spine was placed awkwardly. The mouse that you are using, maybe after some days you feel that, my goodness, I cannot move my hand in a better way I used to do. I cannot move my, uh, you know, uh, a wrist because you have overused it. You have pressed the median nerve. The structure of the mouse necessitated you to move in an awkward posture and you have started feeling those discomforts. I bet that some of you definitely are I have experienced some kind of this uh, discomforts. Did you? Movement problems in hand, low back problems. The most common these days is tension neck syndrome. You find your neck to be awkwardly postured because you, f you keep your, uh, have you guys re uh, realized that when you keep your keyboard and you try to type with your fingers, if your fingers are then you downwards. That means your neck is in flex posture. If you are trying to make your neck neutral, then obviously your hands will come up. There has to be that. You cannot do this. You have to do this. So either you are flexing your neck muscle or you are keeping your hands on air. Both are bad. What would be the suitable one? You can find a wonderfully ergonomically designed computer workstation where you are maybe lying backwards and the whole station is in front of you, your uh, neck is at rest, your arms are at rest, but that won't be possible all the time. They are very expensive and I bet your employer won't let you do that. So we as safety profession professionals, we intervene in these situations. This was part of my doctoral thesis where I was collecting data on drywall installers. I was not supposed to do my thesis on that. My advisor told me that you will choose your own subject because you know you, would you have to find it out 
where they need an intervention. I am not going to dictate it to you. So, I was collecting data on them for the whole day about their hand posture, their leg posture, their trunk posture, uh, the amount of uh, a load they are handling, the amount of uh, the a type of equipment that they are using and I found out that they are installing ha up to 70 pounds, 110 pounds of load <coughs> every minute. They are carrying it, they are installing it by raising it while being on the narrow rungs of the ladder. One of them stretches their arm, holds it for several minutes, the other one, they work in pairs, the other one uses a screw gun to attach it and then vice versa. The other one uses a uh, raised hand and the, uh, this guy would use the screw gun. And it is no fun to use the screw gun. You need a lot of pressure to put the screw gun to affix the panel permanently to the ceiling. Uh, this is just an example that I found out how much flexion and how much awkward postures they were doing. I was also talking to them. I needed to know whether my observation whether my quantification of their hazard, their risk is actually felt by them. It is in their perception also, otherwise it would not make any sense to me. So, I used to ask them, how much do you feel the pressure? What is a concern of you? Do you think that it is too much load? And they told me that why, while we are on the narrow rung of the ladder, we are in a difficult situation. We have to balance ourselves, at the same time we have to bear the load. Think of yourselves in that situation. You are on a narrow rung of a ladder, you are balancing your posture, you do not want to fall down, those ladders do not have side rails and you are bearing those heavy load on yourself. I ask them, what happens to you when you go back home? They say that my, our necks, our back and our hands hurt all the time. We have to change our jobs after 5 years or 10 years. So, I gave myself some time. I wanted to have my career in uh, safety and ergonomics and I gave myself some time. I thought of a solution. There was no way I could intervene just by giving them a new material tool, a new material, uh, you know, manually handling operating uh, instrument that would raise the panels. They won't use it. It's very hard to introduce a solution. They have their work culture. They have their work setting. They are not going to you know, they, they, it won't be uh, simple to use your solution, even if it is efficient, even if it is good. They told me in one site that they were using, see the third picture, the manually operated um, lifting equipment to raise the rival panels and it is taking a lot of time from them. I asked them, what can be a simple solution? And they told me, it is your research. I told them, it is your job. You know much better than me. I can facilitate a group, but I cannot dictate your work. They told me, okay, let us use an electrically operated lift. Someone will go on the lift while raising the drywall panels and the other person will use a narrow piece of drywall panel, they call it a dead man and would support it. By doing this, they actually reduced the risk because they do not need to do this posture, they do not need to be on the narrow rungs of the ladder. I just wanted to give you an option that how it was very rewarding for me. Not because I published it in a very good journal, but because at the end of the class, they told me that they are happier with this operation because it saved their labor, it saved their time, their foreman was happy on them. Based on that dead man piece, I have introduced a new prototype uh, back in Greater Boston area, which my committee and me named Hangers Helper. It is nothing, it is based on the same <coughs> principle that someone would fit it just beside the panel. It has a pole, you can change the length anytime. It has a very flexible top portion, you can fit it at any angle, and I am trying to modify, I have modified the top portion. Uh, from a steel manufacturing company and I want to test it again. But however, just to give you an example that this also worked beautifully with them. This was not a permanent structure though, 
it was a prototype, first generation prototype and I am trying to change the generation to next one. So, to give you an example, do you realize that if you are able to use your skill and your, your expertise, you are not only helping them, you are having a rewarding job by yourself. You are not changing the whole process, you are not changing the whole task, they are doing their task. You are facilitating them by asking a new innovative process. You as a safety professional have all the evidences whether that process would work or not and then you just implement it and you collect the data in a methodological way, methodical way and you know the result, you know how efficient it was. Now about the effectiveness I cannot guarantee because that depends on so many factors. Their company might have rejected it, their foreman might have rejected it, they themselves might have rejected it. But in this case it was not because the production rate went higher and sometimes that is the deciding factor whether a company would accept it or not. So that is how we as safety uh, professionals work in close collaboration with everyone. Let us say we work in very close collaboration with uh, engineers because they know how to make something, they know the manufacturing thing and I know how to make it user friendly. I have also um, collaborators from other fields such as physiologists, such as psychologists because I do also want to know that what perception or I mean what would be a good perception or what should be uh, the optimum perception of the users when they try to use it. How many of you know about the fox nest tragedy? It happened in West Virginia. We are in that part of the country which actually contributed to all of the you know safety and health movement for the workers. They were constructing a tunnel. It was full of silica particles. The workers did have silicosis when they were working there. Their bodies were getting dumped into the river and when the management was visiting them, they were having the mask. This incident actually heavily, you know, uh, uh, it was reported by the Joint Commission and uh, based on this incident, the Black Lung Act was passed. However, this is just to show you an example that how important workers' health are. You cannot just omit the safety and health perspective of the workers just by saying that our job is getting done. That is why the safety professionals job, they would never lose their job. Just to give you a small example or uh, uh, the area of focus, we do focus in you know uh, construction safety, manufacturing safety, workers compensation, mine safety, general industry safety in our department. Our program is AVID accredited. These are some of the uh, courses that I have listed here. And uh, to give you an example, what I did is you can see the first picture it was in Greater Boston. I was doing a lot of focus groups with the construction workers there. Uh, in the fourth picture, you would see me, uh, it is it, in a mine, a deep mine in West Virginia. It is not a surface mine. So uh, that gave me another opportunity to visit a hard to reach worker group apart from construction. I thought that construction is the most tough uh, work atmosphere to intervene on. I was wrong. It is definitely mine. We have a very good industrial hygiene laboratory. Professor McIntosh takes care of that. And we have a very good faculty and student research ratio and very good working relation there. These are some of the industries that our students have gone in the future. I myself have worked in the construction industry. I have worked in the transportation industry. And um, to be precise, I can tell you that all of this, in any industry, you would find that the task is interesting for the safety professionals as well because you do have a say over your job. You have a lot of space to predict the solution because you have the evidences, you can use your own innovation, and you can use the workers as your collaborator. You can go back to the field. You can just simply ask the mine worker, 
what is your idea about this equipment? Do you think that this gives you a better way to see through? Does this alarm gives you a better way to get uh, those bells when you are working under such uh, you know, uh, noisy atmosphere? Based on what they say, you can modify it, you can restructure it. That is why it is very rewarding for us. Uh, I am very proud to say that some of our students have got internships in Tesla Motors, in uh, you know, uh, Ventura Medicals, Marathon Petroleum Area Energy for this summer. And this is how they are getting paid this year, if you have a CSP certification, which is not very tough to get, Certified Safety Professional. You might be wondering how many women does check uh, take the job. So, yeah, I will not, you know, I will not say that there are a lot of women, but definitely the number of women in this profession is increasing day by day. Do you have any question? PowerPoint and whatnot loaded up. Or I got it up. Here? No, right there. I got it. Okay. I need the mic. We'll we'll talk later. All right. So our last speaker is going to be Dr. Paulus Judy, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about the Department of or Division of Computer Science here at Marshall. So with that, let's give him a round of applause. All right. Okay, guys. I know it's 12 o'clock and it's Friday. Is it Friday? <laughs> right? If, so I'll make this quick and painful, okay? I can't do I can only give you one or the other, I mean, okay? I'll met, I'll, I promise you get out as quick as you can. So a lot of the misconception with computer science, and you know, this is one of my favorite things. A lot of people think that that's what we do, you know, we're hacking the stuff and getting to, you know. Uh, parents usually think that we're going over this giant machine about, you know, the size of this whole room. Okay, society probably thinks, oh, you should be creating the next, you know, iPhone or whatever. Uh, the faculty, like myself, thinks all you do is just gaming all day, you know, Warcraft or whatever games. Uh, a lot of the students think they're in the matrix, uh, some of them probably believe. Uh, what they actually do end up is Googling most of the time, how do I do this? Okay, and that's also true at some point, okay? Um, just, you know, to give you an idea, we're not building PCs, right? We're not Geek Squad. I, hopefully nobody works for the Geek Squad, but we're not Geek Squad. We're not fixing PCs, okay? Uh, we're not PC repair, like I said. Uh, we're not IT support. Sort of comes with a major description, you know, your aunt's going to call you up and say, you know, my computer doesn't work, yeah. okay? Uh, we're not miracle workers, all right? If you drop that phone and the screen is cracked and it won't turn on, that's it. Okay. If you took a dive in the river, Ohio River, whatever river, and you have your phone with you, you know, okay, there's some things that we can't fix. Okay, uh, we're not all math genius. All right. Actually, we have a math requirement that's less than engineering. So you know, we only require after calc two. You don't have to take differential equations, and this is my one pitch that I can get the engineering students to come in. Okay, uh, linear algebra, probably probability stats, discrete structures, and then calc one and two, five classes. Okay. Uh, we're not hackers. Some are white hack, you know, black hat, white hat, you know, different thing. Uh, we're not all nocturnal. <laughs> okay. Uh, most of them will send an email at 2 a.m. in the morning, but we're not all nocturnal. Okay. Some can get up. I'll give you the, you know, long version of it. I'm not gonna read it all. Three things: critical thinking, okay, problem solving. And you're in engineering, you're in the same field. But it's a little bit harder with computers because the main weakness of computers, which I'll, you know, there's one big problem with computer science, okay? You develop the solutions for it, okay? There's a reason why they come to computer scientists. They can't do it themselves, okay? If they can do it, they don't need us, okay? We span a lot of multiple fields. It's probably the most applied out of all the sciences, okay? There's a saying math, you know, physics is applied math and chemistry is applied physics and there's probably a next one. Okay, but computer science is mostly applied. Okay. 
just to give you an idea, and if you're not going to computer science, at least look up the CNN best, you know, the website for the best jobs. Okay, they calculate salary, uh, job stress level, okay, hours that you have to work, and so on. So take a look at it, okay, and see if that's some of the things that you wanted to do. Okay, so salary is not the one thing, by the way, guys. You're making 500,000, but you're on call 24/7 for 365. Is that the kind of life you want? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I have a couple of students making 200,000, but they fly everywhere every week. They're a consulting company, right, for Microsoft. They fly and you don't have to worry about anything. But one day he told me that I got up, I think he said about two years ago, he got up and he does not know where he is. He forgot completely. I mean, he was so tired, he just went to bed, got up, and I, I don't know. I have to look it up. Okay? But if that's what you like to do, hey, I'm at it. He has a lot of mileage. He, he can travel all over the world now for free. Okay? <laughs> But computer science related field is up there, okay? 2012, you know, I'm gonna give you, you know, an idea. In 2012, a bunch of them have CS. In 2015, a bunch of them have CS, okay? Which one will you get if you graduate as a computer scientist? I honestly can't tell you, okay? Depends on your interest, depends on what you're strong at, depends on the job that's available in the market, okay? And depends who wants to hire you, of course, okay? And of course, what you're looking for, okay? Security is always big. There's always a need for security. Uh, the good thing about the security people, you get to work from home. Okay, why? Because you, being in the site and being remote, not a big difference. Actually, all the attackers are remote. Right? Nobody's coming to right to the data center. As long as, uh -huh. Right? They gotta be hacking to somebody. Anybody ever got an email from a prince of Sudan, third cousin, fifth brother, twice removed? Uncle got killed, dad got poisoned, I got half a million dollars I need to move, give me your bank account, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, other kinds, you probably get an email saying, this is IT, we haven't seen you logged in, give me your username and password to make sure you actually still exist. Anybody got that? Okay, don't, please don't reply to those, okay? They will never have to, be, you know, any for that. Uh, anybody here ever got their credit card stolen? or their student ID or student credit card and see the charges from Cabela. That's apparently what's going on. If a student at Marshall got their ID stolen, the first thing that got shot, you know, the people go shopping at Cabela in Charleston. You know, all right? So, but there's fields that are there. And number two is video game designer. I know everybody here at least played some version of games. That one is probably the hardest one to get in, okay? Because there, it's, there's a high turnout Okay, turnaround time for them, they got burned out okay, really easily. There's a game that has to be released by spring of 2017, and then needs to be released then. Right? You hardly hear a game get delayed. Okay? They burn you out massively. Okay? At the same time, it's very hard to get in. You need to have a set of skills and experience. 2015, just to give you an idea of salary, I know Dr. Dasgupta gives some salary, so we need that too. These are some of the salaries you have. Okay? Close to six figures. Right? Of course, these are with experience. Okay? In computer science, the average is about 60,000, starting off as a fresh graduate with experience interning and things like that, about 60 to 70,000. Okay? And a lot of them will get a promotion within the first two years if you did really well, and you'll be closer to the six figures by then. Okay? Now, what we do at Marshall, all right, here's all the faculty members. If you see them in the hallway, say hi. Yeah. Hey, that's Dr. Wajudi, you came to the top of my class. Okay? Uh, but don't ask me to fix your computer. <laughs> All right? Now, if you lost some files that are homework for Dr. Michelson, you know, and you said, you know, oh, it was deleted, I couldn't get a hold of it, you know, he might come to me and say, is, is that really deleted? Okay? Or you swear that you log on to Blackboard to try to submit it, but Blackboard was down? <laughs> okay? There's a record for all that. Okay? So what do we do? We are student-centric. You probably realize that Marshall is not that big of a school. Right? We're student-centric. Okay? All the lectures always have a hands-on activity. Okay? We have special things you know, that we focus on in terms of topics. You know, network cybersecurity, that's my field. Okay? Computer graphics, there's one of the faculty. Big data and data mining, Dr. Malik, that's a specialty. So we focus on certain things. Okay? But the program itself is generic. Okay? You could be, I told my students, you could be working for the FBI, and we have a student that work for the FBI, or you can work for Walmart, and we have a student that work for Walmart. Okay, not stocking shelves, right? But you're programming for Walmart. Ever been to Walmart when the power is out? 
Just leave. Just go. Nothing will get done. Nothing works. They can't scan the barcode. They, nothing. They can do anything. It's all computerized. Okay. If you're thinking right now, looking at Walmart, what do you think will be sale in terms of clothing? Winter gear or summer gear? You'll, be have more, you'll have more winter than summer, even though the weather is not really correct. But they look at the data historically. This is about time it gets cold you know, around the area. right? Stack on the winter stuff. You won't be looking for bikinis at this time. right? Just to give you some of the students that, you know, you want, you're a student, right? You, want, you don't care what the faculty does. You want to see what you can do. So the student did this with, you know, under my advisement. We have what is called SAM, so self-attacking machine. So you put it in any network, hook it up, okay, and it'll start attacking the network or collecting information that it likes, you know, or what it wants to, okay? We did not deploy this in any Marshall University network. Your dorm is safe. <laughs> okay, all right? Sorry about that. All right, pinpoint. All right, everybody use the GPS and Google Maps at some point. I know, and probably get still get lost. You know, probably blame the computer scientists there. Okay, but indoors you haven't realized it. Your GPS doesn't work. All right. Let me make it easier. You play Pokemon Go indoors? You can't. Right. The GPS can't pinpoint your location. You just approximate because there's so many things that you know block your signal. But what we do have is a bunch of wireless signal, you know, access point. I'm trying to find if there's one in this room. I don't see one. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there's a couple of them in this. Okay. Now, based on the signal strength of that access point and the strength of that one that you're sitting in here, for example, I can triangulate where you live, you know, where you are. Okay. So that's the idea that we're using. Of course, not just two. You need more because the issue is you got walls, and that changes the calculation. So that's one of the projects that the student did. Okay, so you know these are a students' project. You know, not graduate student, all undergraduate. Lockout. Okay, I know you've had that password that have to be eight characters long, alphanumeric, at least one symbol, one uppercase, lowercase, right? And what do you do? You ended up typing it in your email. You you know have a note in your phone. Okay, probably not the safest way. All right, biometrics, right? Thumb fingers. You probably work somewhere. You got to you know. Sign in with your thumb or your index finger. What's the problem with that? Anybody? I think very malicious. What is it? Yeah, in what way? Even easier than copying. They can lob your finger off and carry it around. Right? <laughs> I was saying, think about malicious and mean. I, I hate to scare you, but that's happened. I mean, it's Halloween, so. Right? They can get your finger off. That's your ID. Okay? So one of the things that one of the students looked at is this thing called lockout. One thing that they it's very hard to copy is your typing style. Okay, how fast do you type something? Okay, how do you get from A to Z to L and all this stuff? So if I can store, you know, so you train the system. This is, you know, I can identify. Oh, that's X Y Z. That one is very hard to duplicate. Okay, now what's the problem? Well, not everybody always type the same way. Okay, we found out about this. Some people like to type while they're holding coke. And then they use both hands. Won't identify them. Okay. So there are some issues, of course. But it's a student project. You know, we're encouraging that. Uh, anybody live in Charleston? Remember a couple years ago, Freedom Industry spilled a bunch of stuff in the, you know, hey, you know, it's good for you. Drop it in the water. You know? It does not turn your water in flames, right? You should turn a fox and you light it up, it doesn't know. That's a couple years back. <laughs> okay. But the problem with that is you don't know how bad it is when you get there. People in Huntington are scared to death. It's like, is it going to affect us? All right. One thing you don't, I don't know if you realize, but Cincinnati shut down their water system because they predicted at that point it will be crossing you know, Ohio River all the way to Cincinnati. Okay. Does it really matter at that point? So the students said, okay, can't we just simulate it? Right. We know how big the Ohio River, you know, kind of just the middle of it. We know how it's the parts per million. The current technology is to go there on the field, get a water sample, send it to the lab. That might take 24 hours, 12 hours. You know, it takes some time. Let's model it with the computer. Okay. Uh, spot detection is one of my personal favorite, and one of the student also personal favorite. Parking, right? Everybody park in a really good place, right? So can't we use a computer, you know, to figure out whether that spot is taken and tell you there's five spots left behind the engineering building? Okay, and as you drive, it goes down four, three, two, one, and disappear. Okay, 
All right, one of my favorite pastimes from the engineering building, look up, I look down, I play the Jaws song. <laughs> then find a parking spot, go back, you know, go to the stadium. Okay? So that's, you know, like I said, quick and painful. You know, there's a bunch of other projects, but that's what you do. You know, you develop a solution from an existing problem using the computers. Okay? Any questions, concerns, comments, complaints? That goes to this guy. <laughs> Thank you.